design has always had its tentacles in other things and other things have always had their tentacles in design. There's been a right. great give and take. And the more people recognize that and don't separate out the specialities, the more that designer of the future will be able to uh, embolden themselves. Hello, and welcome to Design Adjacent, the podcast that talks about the nexus of design, both today and tomorrow. I'm your host, Benny F. Johnson. And today, our special guest is graphic designer, noted art director, design critic, author, and Boy Scout. Our guest today is none other than Stephen Heller. For those who aren't familiar with Stephen, Stephen Heller held the position of senior art director at the New York Times. He's a prolific writer, having authored or co-authored over 200 books about the history and practice of typography, illustration, graphic design, popular culture, and propaganda. He's worked as an editor. He's also been a part of AIGA's prestigious Journal of Graphic Design. He's been an educator and co-founded the MFA Designer as Entrepreneur Program at the School of Visual Arts in New York. He lectures on the history of graphic design and teaches writing classes at SVA's Design Writing Program on research and criticism. It's with partners and writers and co-collaborators that Stephen has introduced the world to incredible ideas that combine work, words, and wisdom, illustration, and thoughts on our future. Most recently, he has been the recipient of the Smithsonian Institution's National Design Award for being a design mind. Also, he's an AIGA medalist for lifetime achievement. The work that he has done inspired our annual Stephen Heller Prize for Cultural Commentary that creates a spotlight on individuals who best exemplify the tradition of prolific writing and boundless curiosity. We're excited that he has not just one new book coming up, but two books coming out this fall. And we'll let him talk a bit more about that later. But first, I'd like to welcome to Design Adjacent, none other than Stephen Heller. Benny, it's great to be here. Thank you, good sir. Thank you. It's quite an honor. And I like to start where most of us start, which is each day, those in the design community, those interested in business and creativity, we're often graced with the Daily Heller. We get your words and inspiration and insight and history every day. And I know it's a part of my start. So I'd like to start off with asking you, how do you start your day? Well, I'm honored that you say that because you never know whether anybody is out there reading or listening or just going about their uh, morning rituals. My morning ritual is to get up around 5.30. My wife and I, Louise Feely, play Spelling Bee, the New York Times puzzle. And we have to make genius or our day is ruined. And frankly, I have to be the genius or my day is ruined. We usually split the genius kudos. She gets a lot of the tough words. I get all the four-letter words. And she's become Queen Bee at least three times. And I haven't managed King Bee at all. But, you know, there, there's something beautiful about that. You have a harmony at home now, don't you? We do, indeed. <laughs> Life is good. So it's interesting when we talk about all the roles and the way we describe ourselves, graphic designer, art director, design critic, author. How do you define yourself these days? How do you most identify? I most identify as a getting older man of being at a critical time in history where mm -hmm. I hope that what I have to offer has some relevance to younger people. You reach a certain point where you cross a Rubicon and I always call the Rubicon the noughts. So when I went from 40 to 50, I crossed the Rubicon. The minute I became 41, the clock started all over again, and so on and so forth. And now that I'm 71, the clock has started over again. And I'm hoping that I can still have something to offer designers and other people who are interested in 
visual consumption. I will, for one, will say that, you know, in presence of our conversation here, I believe you have a ton to, to offer us as we think about navigating our world today and around us. I'd love to start a little bit about your journey because as I have conversations with senior professionals, those emerging and students, there's always this mystification around the journey, right? As we go through it, we don't take advantage of, we don't understand what's happening in there. We're always wondering, are we doing the right things? Are we going the right ways? Your career path has been astonishing. I'd love to talk a little bit about those moments. And we may not do it in linear fashion because I like to make mix it up for your little fun. But I love to talk about first days. What was your first day when you walked into New York Times? What was that like for you? Well, the first day walking into the New York Times was incredible. I still remember it. We had an art department that looked kind of like Macy's basement. They were just these long desks, rows of desks. There were no offices whatsoever. It was akin to a newsroom. And there weren't that many people there. So it was this gigantic room with one or two, three, maybe four people sitting at these super long expanses. And I just looked at them and I thought to myself, I hope the first six months go quickly. <laughs> because it was an experience that terrified me. I had been working for underground newspapers for four or five years before that. And this was not that same experience. This was the adult world. This was the most prestigious newspaper on the face of the planet. This was the thing that my parents could understand. They couldn't understand when I worked through left-wing papers. So I just remember wanting that time to go by where I could assimilate all the information that I had to meet all the people that I needed to meet and do the work that I could do without feeling incompetent. Talk a bit about that first day and that, that incredibleness. What did it also feel like to somewhat catch the tail of the dream, right? You've been working in these smaller publications, you're working on the space in there. And like you said, you walk into the space that everybody else understood, but it's now on you to kind of move it forward. It was terrifying. I'm actually glad you're asking these questions because I think about them when I'm in my twilight stage, you know, between going to sleep and actually not falling asleep. But I kind of push them out of my head because I can't go back and make them different. But what I felt was beyond my capacity to do anything. You know, mm -hmm. I, I was not, I was 24 and I was not ready for that kind of role, although I wished that role would be put upon me. So it was really both awe and wonder, and as I said, terror and fear. And every day was a, a challenge. And I literally worked seven days a week and usually on holidays. That was one way I could get away from having to go to my family's place for uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner. You use the Times. I use the Times as an <laughs> right. excuse. We're a daily newspaper. And I work We're on a daily, daily newspaper. page. Now, as we skip ahead, when did you, if ever, did you have the moment where it became quieting, where it wasn't so much of a terrifying moment, but that you felt like you reached a period of mastery? Never. Awesome. You know, I, I ask the questions like that because for so many of us, sometimes we think that there is that end where it all goes away, that I've listened to performers say, when they stop being terrified, they know it's time to stop performing. Well, I wrote a piece a few months ago, maybe a year ago. Time is going in such a strange direction, thanks to COVID, called incompetence, the joy of incompetence. And when I left the New York Times after almost 33 years, I didn't take any of the skills with me. I left them there. I'll just tell you this little anecdote by way of introduction. I've been married three times, my current wife, 37 years. But my middle wife was a scholar, and she basically taught me how to write. But she would give me scholarly texts, and when I asked her to edit my pieces, she would edit them as though she were a professor. 
So when we split up, I kept the apartment and she took the big words. <laughs> so there was this feeling of loss because I lost somebody that I was close to and, you know, right. all of that. But I also felt I lost a certain competency. Mm. And when I left the Times, part of the Times was my competency. Sure, I knew how to put a page together. I knew how to call an illustrator. I knew how to say to that illustrator, this would work better here or there like any art director would do. Or as any good art director would do, I just leave them alone. And when I left, I was kind of at sea, even though I went right to the School of Visual Arts where I had 40 students. But, you know, competency is one of those things that you and I can see how other people are more than competent. They're talented, they're skilled, they're genius, but we can't see it in ourselves. We know we have certain attributes, otherwise we wouldn't be in the places we're in. But to really convince ourselves, that's tough. Right. So, you know, I'm going to ask this question a little differently now, just the way you described it. As a designer and a creative, when did you first fall in love with words? Oh, I fell in love with words at the same time I fell in love with pictures. And that was my immigrant grandmother reading me a book about Anatole the Mouse. And that was the first book I learned how to read. She, with her Yiddish accent, taught me how to read English and Yiddish. And I could make it things come to life because of those pictures. So the words were a way of telling the story that I was looking at in pictures. So one couldn't occur without the other. One couldn't happen without the other. For the longest time, I, I would think to myself, how could writers write without showing pictures? And then it right. occurred to me that you have mental pictures from their writing. And the best writers, and I've been reading Joan Didion ever since she passed away, just giving mm -hmm. such a tableau of image and word that it's hard not to have all these things running around in your head. It's great to hear you say that because I always think about it when I read your work in space. I see the creative mind. I see the designer's mind. I see the, the vividness and the care for the words and the images all kind of working together. It's really powerful in that sense. And then the ongoing commitment. We talked at the beginning about the notion of daily Heller being able to commit to continuing to write and share stories. What keeps you inspired each day to kind of share something else with the world? Well, I hate to say it, but it's fear of failure. Okay. That, no, no you, this is a safe space. You can say that. Uh, I <laughs> so, hate to admit it to myself. If we're getting down to brass tacks, Dr. Benny. Yeah. Uh, All right. <laughs> I've always had that quintessential inferiority complex. And the only way you can overcome that is by accomplishment. And accomplishment is often judged on the exterior, not on the interior. So I had to have evidence of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. And I do the daily because I need to say to myself, I've done one thing during the day. You know, there could be more than one thing. And then I'm really elated. You know, on the weekends, for example, I don't do the Daily Heller. I used to. I kind of forced myself on print magazine to let me do weekend Heller. Then it just got too much. But on the weekends, I don't feel as accomplished as I do on the weekdays. So weekends for me aren't times of rest. They're times of anxiety. When you think about work, you know, we talk about the first day at the New York Times. How was the first day at SVA? So here you are, you've kind of left the expertise behind, as you said before, and you're coming into this new realm where you're now a novice again. How was that first day at SVA? Well, you mentioned that I have a couple of books coming out. One of them is, is a memoir with Princeton Architectural mm -hmm. Press in the fall, and it's called Growing Up Underground, and it's about the years 66 to 76. And okay. that was when I was just in high school, coming out of high school, going to work for papers, 
ultimately getting the job at the New York Times, which was as big a shock to me as anybody else. And I forgot the question. How did you feel when you walked into SVF, How did I, oh, starting yes. this kind of pivot? Right. Your, so your first day, which is, you know, it's kind of talking about your journey in the path, that first yeah, day. My first day going into SVA was when I was going to SVA as a student. Mm-hmm. And I was 18 or 19. I forget exactly what. I had been at NYU. I had been thrown out of NYU. I had to get a draft deferment because the Vietnam War was going on and I was not going to go. And rather than go to Sweden where we had arranged a safe house, I figured I wanted to stay in New York and SVA was the place to attend. Mm. And that's a long history that we can't go into now. It's in the book. But okay, it was funny that a year or so after I was asked to leave SVA for not going to classes, they asked me to teach and I taught a newspaper class. And that was just another example of I'm not competent to do this. Why am I doing this? How could this how could they put their trust in me and having somebody's trust? makes you, you know, you asked about what is it that inspires? And that is one of the things that inspires being trusted by other people to do things that you don't think you can do. We were talking about the intro and I was doing some reading and I I came across where something mentioned that you were a Boy Scout. And I was like, oh my goodness, Stephen and I have that in common. And I started thinking back about the attributes that go along with being a Boy Scout. And one of the things that I always struggled with as a Boy Scout is all the attributes are about establishing things. They're not about being disruptive and creating change and doing new items. And so I was this kid who was always thinking of something new or breaking something or what could be faster, what could be better. And there was always this misalignment with the space. And so I was thinking about it before before our conversation. I was like, You know, as you approach the world, there's so many things that experience gives you. But how do you think about that when it comes to creating things that are new? Well, I think you and I are probably we're the same kind of Boy Scout, although I'm sure you made it closer to Eagle Scout than I did. I stayed at Tenderfoot. (laughs) I was always rebellious. I went to a summer military school as well, where I started my own army which is another long, boring story. But newness is something that is both frightening, inevitable. Mm -hmm. It's a responsibility that we all have to not be mediocre and not maintain the status quo. And at the same time, be nervous about that newness, about change. A perfect example of my fear of change is that in a house that I have in the country, once the living room had a few pieces of furniture and okay. I went upstairs for something to get a drink for somebody or whatever. And when I came down, all the furniture was rearranged and my guests, many of whom were illustrators, had decided to move all the furniture around and it drove me crazy. They just decided. They just decided. <laughs> I mean, the furniture was easy to move and There was no plan. It wasn't like I designed the room. It was just like, but that it wasn't the way I left it for the 10 minutes that I was upstairs doing whatever I was doing just freaked me out. So I have an ambivalent relationship with newness. Newness is essential. It's essential to progress and progress is essential to life. Right. And whenever anybody says to me, we're in the same place we were 10, 15, 20, 30, 100 years ago, I say there's always been change. And people are very resistant to change, whatever that change may be. And I'm just as resistant, but at the same time, I know it has to happen. So talk about a sense of space. So I was looking at a a photograph and I'm going to do my best to paint with my voice and words, this photograph. And it was a photo taken of you, Stephen, in your office and in front of the most massive and impressive 
two slats of books and experiences and toys and image. This image is incredibly rich with it. If I use my imagination, all of these moments and mementos across your career and scholarship and ideas. When you think about this space, and it, it prompts my imagination to say, what an incredible space to kind of work and think of ideas where you have all of this at your fingertip. I asked today, as we spend more time by ourselves and at home, what are the spaces that you feel more creative, most Man, creative? I love your questions. These are questions I've never gotten before. I feel the most creative when I'm in other people's spaces. Part of it is kind of uh, competition. Okay. You know, it, COVID had this one interesting effect on me because I stayed home and I'm st mm -hmm. even still staying home more than I used to. I don't have to compete, which means I can mellow out a little bit. I don't have to be so voracious or avaricious. Right. So when I'm in somebody else's space and I see what they have worked on, on their desks or on their easels or on their walls, what they've collected and collections are really extensions of oneself. That's when I feel like I've got to get back and get onto my own computer and start writing again mm -hmm. or start organizing or making a book or whatever it is. I mean, to me, a book is a collection. And right. that picture that you're looking at, if I know what you're looking at, I think, you, yeah, that's the one. I equate it to a kind of military persona where mm -hmm. you have an officer or a non-commissioned officer or somebody who's accomplished a lot, whether it's through bravery or just being in a certain place at a certain time, they wear ribbon bars and they wear all sorts of insignia. And that's what those shelves are to me. They're kind of my okay. symbols of accomplishment. Whether I made them or somebody else made them, I have them. It's so interesting to hear you frame it that way. And when you started talking about going into other people's space, I realized that's what was happening to me looking at this picture. It's inviting. I want to reach in and pull out the toy or pull out the memento or the book out of the line and dive in and find out more about it. Those magazines, those shelter magazines that show people's homes, of course, they're idealized and they're stylized. But the ones that really show clutter, like the magazine Nest that existed about yes. a decade ago, those Walking into somebody else's space, particularly when it's eccentric mm -hmm. space, is just remarkable. You know, it's and you want to pull things out of those pictures. And that's why those books do so well in the marketplace. There's a certain envy, vicarious thrill, whatever. Right. There really is. It's kind of you you walk through. I, I know in our home, as our kids became older, I stopped apologizing for the live life that was happening in the house so that we'd go in and we'd have a painting by an artist of note and my son's Lego construction right next right. to it. And there's no high, low, it's all a part of our life and our experience and they're in conversation with each other. And that conversation is about our life. Yeah. It's a beautiful way of putting it. But the picture is just so it was just so inviting. I'm like, what is that? Why do you have that? It opens up all of those questions. Why, Stephen? What's your deal? What's going on here? <laughs> Why are these books together? Uh, Where are the overdose on it? Because I certainly uh -huh. overdose doing it. There's a film that my son, who's a filmmaker, New York Nico, he's called, or Nicholas Heller, Heller Films. He did something called The Cave. And it's an apartment that I had that is filled with all the detritus that I've collected and the books that I've made and the books that I've found and all the other bits of popular culture that I've kind of archived and ar archaeologized, if that's a word. Certainly, in another lifetime, I would probably consider becoming an archaeologist just to dig down deep and find things that once existed and are not with us any longer. You know, it's a beautiful exploration. I see that when I look through things, but I see it in the sun, in the eyes of my son now, as he starts to dig into 
what his dad has, what grandpa has, what grandma has, and watching him dig through music and photographs and books and video and making his own kind of way in it and, and asking those questions and digging in, being shocked by what he finds and being excited by it at the same time. Well, also, your son is 13. For lots of kids, that doesn't happen until they're much older. You know, he's got to jump on this kind of personal history because there are people he can talk to about it. I mean, I wasn't interested in my parents' old pictures. I wasn't interested in my grandparents' old documents from the old country until much later in life when it became an obsession. And, you know, I always say to myself that I need to deassess things so that my son doesn't get stuck with them. But he started, he's 32 now, but he started when he was 20 to start being interested in them and what they mean to him and how he can translate it into film, into video, into storytelling. And that's why he did this movie, The Cave. Right. We talk a bit about our children and it naturally makes you think about the future. And we know design is innovative by its very nature. It creates, it motivates, it changes the way we think about the world around us and interact with it. As you think about the days ahead, what do you think the future holds for designs and designers? And I know that's a big question, I, but I love to ask well, the question. Well, it's the question you know? I always say if I knew I'd be rich, but the way <laughs> right. you're asking it is so soothing that I can <laughs> say without hesitation that design is going to be so multidisciplinary, we're not going to recognize it. Mm -hmm. That right. these ghettos that we've created of specialty mm -hmm. and metier and genre are going to mesh as they are now into something that we can't even define yet. You know, we come up with crazy right. words to talk about new media or... Right. interactive this and experiential that and strategy that I think all of these things are going to be coming together where graphic design, particularly, but also product three-dimensional design are going to be taught as liberal arts classes in schools right. and particularly to younger kids because they're going to need the language of design to move around, to get around and do things. And the more they can be given that language in whatever way it will be presented, the better off everybody will be. It's so true and in a really small way, but it was humbling and shocking for me. I was thinking about having conversations with my son and daughter who are middle schoolers. They actually comprehend what is a font. Mm -hmm. I don't know when I first learned what a font was. My kids actually understand because of their interaction with print and type and form and they, they, and it has nothing to do with dad's job, right? They knew this pre AIGA and they have an opinion, right? And it's informed and it's reinforced by experience. It's a completely different way of interacting with the world, but I'm sitting here and I'm listening to them talk about thoughts. Well, think about our great grandparents thinking about the word radio all of the discoveries that become part of the vernacular and part of the ambient lifestyles that we live. A font is their world. You know, do they know about lead pencils? Do they know about retractable lead? <laughs> Racers? You know, it, they know about it because their mom, my wife, is a math ah. teacher by training. And as a math teacher, no matter how much technology you have, the best way to learn math, and most math teachers will attest, is through the point of a pencil and any eraser. Well, that's design. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Milton Glaser always said, design is drawing. And every designer I know, even those who are totally in the digital world, black wing pencil when they get a chance. Right. You go back to the pencil. So what's really interesting for me, I'm thinking back to a review that I read on a friend who has a show up currently at MoMA and he's the artist, Adam Pendleton. And we talk about defying lines and the critique they write up said, this is the first truly 21st century show. Mm. 
And his solo at, at the MoMA, it's not in a gallery by itself. It actually takes place in the middle of the space. It's sound, it's image, it's reinterpreted sound and image, it's drawing, it's painting, it's typography. And all the things that you mentioned before, there are no ghettoized lines. It's kind of everything worked through this purpose in that. And it kind of, in watching it and reading about it, it speaks to what we're saying, this future that we're not defined by those lines. That's the beauty of the new MoMA, the way it was redesigned Mm -hmm. to kind of take down the walls and make it transparent and at the same time allow that transparency to uh, grow in different ways. Now, to kind of extend our conversation about the future, you also have the role as an educator. So how do you think about equipping the next generation and the next generation through learning for this new future? Well, it's a complicated answer. I started with my co-chair, Lita Tellerico, at SVA, MFA designer as entrepreneur, by putting together a program that would go beyond service design, that would go into self discovery and entrepreneurial production. And that was 25 years ago. And all of that stuff has happened. I thought it was brilliant, but at the same time, there were so many people who were thinking the same thoughts and probably doing the same things. As an educator, I think you've got to somehow be two steps ahead of the rest of the crowd. You'll never get to be three steps ahead because the crowd is really quite smart. And then there's the crowd that creates all the technology that makes our crowd, gives our crowd the power to do what they do. I mean, you couldn't have been a design entrepreneur without the computer. It's it's so true. And yet that has then amplified and made it such that designers and creators can see themselves as entrepreneurs. We did one of the first things we worked on um, coming to AIGA was understanding the market and doing a lot of kind of in-depth market research. And something that was telling was that we saw over 80% of those in design or space will eventually run their own enterprise, Mm -hmm. eventually start. And it wasn't something that was clearly articulated on the front end. It took a lot of kind of conversations to getting that. We may use different language to describe it, but at the end of the day, there was entrepreneurship writ large within the design. Well, I think if you substitute the word freedom, Mm. that entrepreneurship gives you freedom to care about different constituencies. And one of those constituencies is yourself. You're telling your own story through a product. And that story that you're telling about yourself or about your life or about the world around you gets universalized and brought out to others. And I think designers are in a great place to do that because they can make it happen. You know, there used to be these commercials on TV about patenting your products. They were on at six in the morning or one in the morning or something. And it really was a kind of role model for me that people in their garages were making inventions and some of them were crazy and some of them were not. And, you know, you've probably seen that wonderful photograph of the first Mac you know, with Wozniak and Jobs standing around this wooden box with keys on it. And that became the most important invention of our century. Right. It's one of those things that when we go through that list of Boy Scout attributes, building something crazy wasn't on that list, right? But what was on the list, and I think really encouraged me throughout life and spacing was something that I learned from that experience, which was the motto of always be prepared. Right. And I think when we think about the future of education, it's, are we doing things that can prepare us for the next, whether it's crazy, whether it's unimaginable, are we doing the things that will give us the tools to go forward? What do you think today are the, are the tools that design schools are going to have to put forth for us for the next five years? Well, I think it's a difficult dichotomy. On one Mm -hmm. hand, you have to be aware of what the market is, what will be accepted in the marketplace, and how and when that will be accepted. Raymond Lowy used to have a phrase called Maya, most advanced yet acceptable. And so designers have to toe that line of being most advanced 
yet somehow acceptable. Otherwise, you're considered crazy, at least in your lifetime or at least in your productive lifetime, because some of those crazinesses become realities after you've given them up or you've put them in your drawer. And that's what we found with a lot of our students, that they've had these great ideas, but the technology wasn't there for them yet, or the market wasn't there for them yet. The cultural moment exactly. wasn't there for them yet. You know, how many things that are brilliant yet overshoot the market moment? Exactly. And it can drive you crazy if when you say, I thought of that. And I thought of that 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so in that vein, as you spend time and you think back over this really wonderful and dynamic career, are there moments or things you wish you could pick back up and start over again to kind of bring forward? Well, to be perfectly honest, there are many moments that I wish I could recreate. I wish I didn't leave school when I left school. But at the same time, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have done what I've done. There's no sense in kind of looking back and saying, I, I wish I could have done that. I'll say that to myself and I'll say it to you, but just between us. Just, just between us. But you know what I love is your path, as we started before, you broke ground in spaces that this wasn't, you didn't follow a recipe, right? You didn't follow a, a logical step. But you did follow a passion-driven step and a, a step in which you kind of built and relied um, on yourself. And like you said, whether it was fear <laughs> or speed to keep you moving ahead, you've done that and created a space that, you know, as I, as I mentioned to several people we were going to be talking, just the overflow of how important your words and example have been for people. And so I was honored to be able to have to continue our conversations, but just to hear how dynamic that is for folks, especially as they navigate these kind of unconventional dynamic careers. Well, I really appreciate you saying that and take it very much to heart, particularly as I'm crossing those Rubicons. But I'm reminded of okay. something Milton Glaser once said to me. I had done a book mm -hmm. called Design Literacy, and I sent it to him as I did most of my things. And he wrote back to me or called me. Actually, he called me and he said, this is okay. It's a lot of meat and no potatoes. And wow. I perfectly understood what he said, what he, was, what he meant. And I quoted it in every other edition of that book. And then I right. thought, you know, I may have been one of the early adopters of this method of writing about design, but I mm -hmm. haven't included a full feast yet. And right. I still haven't made that feast. That's a, a beautiful way of thinking about it. I love the way you talked about being at home and not having these other challenges and challenge in a kind of a gladiatorial sense, right? Like I'm going after it. I asked this question now, as our world opens up a bit more, what environment are you looking to go to next to challenge? Where do you want to get your creative juices flowing next? It's a good question, and I wish I could answer it because I'm, I'm <laughs> trying to cope with it right now. You know, I've done so much that I kind of dreamed about doing, and I've not done so much I've dreamed about doing, but there's a chapter in my uh, memoir called The Impossible Dream. And not to get sappy about Man of La Mancha or anything. It, well, you know, we, we, we've got to do that at least once a day. At least Come once on. a day. Once a week, <laughs> maybe. But I don't know what that next dream state is. I look at my son, basically, and he embodies everything that I would like to have done. And so pride takes over. And that's not a challenge. That's just sitting back on his laurels and living vicariously. And you'll be doing that with yours. You know, yeah, I, I think about that. And I think about when we reach this point where we can actually be partners in an adventure. Yeah, I, my son said he wanted to do a movie with me at one point. And he did do The Cave, as I told you. But I was supposed to do For You Guys and did. 
the uh, interview with Seymour Quast on his 90th birthday. Well, I had asked my son if he would do that with me. He said, sorry, Dad, I'm much too busy. Oh, well, well of course, you know. <laughs> but if Mom asks, he might get a yes. No, I think he <laughs> would I- get the same because what he's been doing in terms of his films and his work is really mm. socially very important. I mean, he's kept businesses alive during the COVID pandemic through his films and through his activities. So I don't begrudge him one bit that he was too busy to make a film with his dad. I think there's a project there, though. I think there is a Heller and Heller project. I don't know where. I don't know what I'll direction. Give you his phone number and you can but whisper it in his ear. Let me know. And, you know, if you need a humble producer to be along with you and, and you know, work out the deal between the two of you, just count you me in. It. So, you know, we talked about going through these kind of changes in the journey. Did you ever see yourself changing hats or did you feel as though they were all additive? Sure. I mean, I started off calling you a designer and an art director and design critic and author. And those are all kind of moments. Um, we talked about identity as what you felt in there, but did you ever feel like you had to trade off one for the other along the no, way? No, because I always felt that it's one big lens. I look through that lens and sometimes, you know, I, I wear Verilux lenses now. So you look up and you see far away and you look down and you see close. It's the same kind of thing. I never thought of them as, I know that there are things I can't do. I can't be a, a doctor. I can't be a scientist, but I could look at medicine and I could look at science through the lens of design. And so everything is of a piece. I love your perspective and answer for that. And I think it's incredibly important for those who are listening in our community of space in there to know that you don't have to have a false choice of being this or that. And there are people who have had binary and trinary and quatrainy careers, Mm -hmm. you know, who have gone from... Mm -hmm. Their love for design, in part because their love was unrequited. You know, the clients made life difficult, so they took up other activities. And some of those activities, I can't tell you how many people I know who moved from design to psychology, you know, which is a helping profession, a therapeutic profession. And they had to have brought some of their design savvy with them as they change careers. But you would say, you would arguably be right in saying that those are two separate activities. Right. Well, one of the things that we've been exploring and I've been having conversations about a lot is this notion that as we move forward, design is evolving as a profession. And then the next conversation is, but it's also evolving your profession too. And when we think about this in the of design adjacency, design is having an impact in medicine, in business, in legal, in engineering, in every field that you can imagine, we're seeing how those things that we hold center to design are starting to impact and expand and change other fields. Yeah, we were talking about this the other night, with some friends and I, on Zoom, which has been the default mm-hmm. to conversation pit. It's the watering hole about how nature fits into the design experience now more than it ever did. I mean, there were always designers like Frederick Law Olmsted or Capability Mm -hmm. Brown making parks for people, making better places to live and making exciting environments. So design has always had its tentacles in other things, and other things have always had their tentacles in design. There's been a great give and take. And the more people recognize that and don't separate out the specialities, the more that designer of the future will be able to uh, embolden themselves. I think that's a perfect way to end our conversation, my friend. The way the designer of the future can embolden themselves. This has been wonderful conversation about career and journey and life with Boy Scout, art director, dad, design critic, and noted author, Stephen Heller. This has been one of the best interviews I've ever had. Thank you.
Thank you. I'm so honored that you joined us on Design Adjacent and look forward to the two new books coming out this fall. And we'll make sure we include links for everyone as well. So look forward to seeing you in New York one day so. soon, my friend. And thank you all for joining us for this episode of Design Adjacent. We invite you back to our next episode where we'll continue to explore the impact and power of design both today and tomorrow in our world. Thank you. Show notes for this episode will be available on AIGA.org. Please subscribe to our show on Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. AIGA's Design Adjacent Podcasts and its contents are the copyright of AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. All rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of the content in any form is prohibited without AIGA's express written permission. My name is Li Shan Huang. Until next time.